A very warm welcome to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's World Commission on Environmental Law Environment Week. This is a five day webinar series to explore current topics in environmental law, current challenges, and of course, their possible solutions. The IUCN WCL is one of the six expert commissions of the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which in itself is the oldest nature conservation international organization. We have a worldwide membership in the World Commission on Environmental Law, and we work through specialist groups. Uh, today's webinar is organized by the specialist group for oceans, coasts, and coral reefs, and its chair, Professor Simi Payne. WCL's aim is to advance environmental law, the capacity of lawyers, and the environmental rule of law around the globe. If you want to know more about WCL, please check our website as it appears now in the link in the chat. My name is Christina Voigt. I'm a professor of law at the University of Oslo in Norway, and I am a member of the steering committee of the World Commission on Environmental Law. The five-day webinar series of WCL is our run-up to the World Environment Day 2021, which is on the uh, 5th of June uh, this year. We started earlier this week on Monday with a webinar on the topic 50 years after the Stockholm Declaration, the long road towards the formulation of binding global principles for environmental protection. On Tuesday, we organized a webinar on the topic of climate change and the law, the dynamics between legislation and litigation. Yesterday, we looked at developing effective strategies for compliance and enforcement of environmental law. And today, we focus on oceans and whether the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea as a living instrument is fit for purpose in addressing challenges of the 21st century. Tomorrow, we will finish with our fifth webinar on biodiversity and the law at 7 p.m. CET. We invited leading experts, scholars, judges, practitioners in the relevant fields that I just mentioned. And we had so far very lively, very interesting discussions among the panelists, but also very interesting uh, questions and engagement from the audiences. If you missed one of the webinars, you will find the recordings on our website and you can listen to them in due course. Before introducing today's topic, I will like to address two housekeeping issues. First of all, we have simultaneous translations into French, Spanish and English, which you can choose at the bottom of your screen as you please. And also please pose your questions in the Q&A box throughout the webinar so that we can address them then to the panelists toward the end, uh, the end of today's um, webinar. I would like to use this occasion to thank very much uh, Emily Gaskin, WCL's executive officer for her tireless work in planning and organizing these webinars uh, and for getting up very early uh, day after day to be ready to help us through uh, our work. I would also like to thank the chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law, Justice Antonio Herman Benjamin, uh, for spearheading this initiative. Let me now welcome you to today's topic, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea as a Living Instrument Solutions for the 21st Century. Now, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, is often referred to as the constitution of the oceans or the sea. And it is a truly impressive and comprehensive treaty addressing the various interests and objectives affiliated with the oceans. 
ranging from the establishment of maritime zones to the regulation of shipping and fisheries and other ocean uses, including in the area, to the protection of the marine environment, just to mention a few aspects. Adopted in 1982, this means that next year in 2022, UNCLOS will celebrate its 40th anniversary. The question is, whether the convention can live up to addressing newer and complex challenges, challenges that were not around at the time when the text was drafted and adopted. For example, since 1982, our understanding of the role of oceans in the climate system has increased and the ocean's potential for climate change mitigation. Similarly, the ocean provides the world with marine biodiversity, a concept not mentioned in the treaty itself, but currently negotiations are underway to adopt a new legally binding instrument uh, under the, uh, on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Further issues have been added since 1982. For example, the issue of sea level rise and the question of how to protect the scale and size of maritime zones, especially exclusive economic zones of small island states against receding baselines due to land inundation, or what, regulat frame, I'm sorry, what regulatory framework, if any, does the convention provide for climate altering technologies, such as ocean fertilization or carbon capture and storage? These are only a few examples, but they show that new issues arise and the question to be discussed at our webinar today is, is UNCLOS as a living instrument as repeatedly pointed out by the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea? Is that a living instrument? And if so, how and to what extent can it provide legal solutions to those or other new challenges, challenges of the 21st century. And before we start, please let me welcome today's moderator, my dear friend and colleague, Professor Simi Payne. Simi is Associate Professor at Rutgers University, and she is focusing on international and environmental law. She has appeared at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea on behalf of the International Union for the Con uh, Conservation of Nature. Prior to Rutgers University, she worked at Berkeley University and as director of the Global Commons Project at University of uh, California and Berkeley Center for Law, Energy and the Environment, she focused on the linkages of state and international climate policy. She also previously practiced natural resource and environmental law at the US Department of the Interior and the law firm of Goodwin Proctor. So she's truly a practitioner and a scholar and a very dedicated expert in the area of the law of the sea. Simi, it's a great pleasure to give the floor to you. Christina, thank you so much for the welcome uh, and the introduction and for your thoughtful framing of our questions today. Uh, before we begin the discussion of the roundtable, it's my pleasure to invite Peter Cochran, who is uh, the, a member of the IUCN Council and who is the representative for the oceans on the Council to offer a few words to launch our discussion today. Peter, please. Thanks, Simi. Uh, good morning, all. Thank you for this opportunity to make a few introductory remarks. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the First Nations peoples and traditional owners of the lands on which we join this meeting from and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Their connection to and knowledge of land and sea is an invaluable part of our collective heritage enriching and guiding our shared futures. I come to you from Sydney and I'm on the lands of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation. And at night I can hear as they would have for thousands of years, the waves of the Pacific Ocean as they meet the rocky shores not far from where I live. 
The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is one of the world's most significant legal documents, but it's less than 30 years old. It was ambitious and visionary at conception, uh, as Christina said, I think, and even when adopted, but our knowledge of how significant the ocean is for the well-being of all life on this planet was poor then and is still remarkably deficient and underappreciated. But while our knowledge has grown, so too have our impacts on marine life, ocean chemistry and physics, and the multiplicity of ecosystem services provided by the ocean. The ocean is a fundamental driver of and buffer for the Earth's weather systems and plays an integral role in the hydrological cycle. Uh, and I just always need to remind myself of these fundamental facts. 97% of the world's water is in the ocean. 95% of the volume of livable habitat for life is in the ocean. Marine life produces nearly half the oxygen we breathe and the oceans convey 90% of world trade. And so what have we done to this critical and so many ways dominant part of our blue planet? 90% of our global fish stocks are depleted or fully exploited, unbalancing and destroying complex food webs. Illegal and unreported and unregulated fishing means our impacts on marine life are far greater than official figures suggest. 93% of the additional heat from anthropogenic modification of our atmosphere has been absorbed by the ocean with this warming contributing to rising sea levels. And the ocean has absorbed 30% of the anthropogenic emissions of CO2, making it increasingly acid. Ocean noise has increased, disrupting animal migration and behavior and no part of the ocean is free from pollution and contamination from the deliberate and inadvertent disposal and inappropriate use of plastics, endocrine disruptors, heavy metals, pesticides, and other toxic chemicals. And our state of knowledge, well, 95% of the ocean is still unexplored and it's stated that over 90% of marine species are yet to be described. So we are limited in our capacity to understand and monitor change. And if this dismal legacy wasn't enough, we are trying new ways of disrupting the ocean and its life and functioning, such as by seabed mining and geoengineering. Finally, ocean governance, another major collective failing. It's hard to conclude that the sectoral governance and management arrangements that have been introduced to address specific problem areas and issues are a universal and resounding success. The ocean is vast and vastly complex, the interrelationships and interactions between different system elements need to be governed and managed as a whole system if we, have to have, if we are to have any chance of addressing the multitude of impacts and dysfunction that are the legacy of our past failings and to slow the rate of change that we have set inexorably in train. So this is ex an extremely pertinent and timely topic. And I'm delighted that this discussion is under the aegis of the World Commission on Environmental Law. You are leaders in innovative and challenging debates and initiatives to help make a just world that values and conserves nature. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And so thank you so much for joining us, even though it's a very late hour in Australia for you. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Thank you for joining us today as we examine this question about how the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which we may sometimes refer to as UNCLOSE, uh, can evolve to respond to our needs for ocean governance in the 21st century. We'll be speaking with very distinguished experts. It's my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce Jell Christian Egge, the International Law Advisor of the Law of the Sea at the Norwegian Foreign Minister, Ministry, beg your pardon. Professor Nilifer Oral, who is Director of the Center of International Law at the National University of Singapore. She is also a member of the United Nations International Law Commission and co-chair of the study group on sea level rise in relation to international law at the ILC. And she is, last but not least, a member of the IUCN WCEL Steering Committee. Professor Patricia Galvao Teles is also a member of the International Law Commission and chair of the Drafting Committee. And she is Professor of International Law at the Autonomous University of Lisbon 
and Senior Legal Consultant on International Law at the Legal Department of the Portuguese Ministry um, of Foreign Affairs. Another distinguished member of the International Law Commission who is joining us today is Professor Dere Tladi, Professor of International Law at the Department of Public Law and the Institute for International and Comparative Law in Africa at the University of Pretoria. And um, we wanna particularly thank all three members of the ILC who are joining us after a very long day of work in Geneva. Professor Catherine Regwell joins us from the UK. She is professor of public international law and a fellow of All Souls College at Oxford University. She is also, and very pertinent to this discussion, co-director of the Sustainable Oceans Program of the Oxford Martin School. Judge Lisbeth Lindstad of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, unfortunately will not be able to join us today due to family illness. After the roundtable discussion, I'll offer brief closing remarks, and then we invite all of you who are able to stay to join us in a question and answer session. Please put your questions using the question that you'll see the little Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. And if we aren't able to answer live, we will try to respond in writing after the webinar. So, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is an international agreement that resulted from the third United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea, which took place between 1973 and 1982. The lengthy negotiation achieved not only the broad scope of topics that Christina described, but a remarkable balance of rights and duties that the majority of states were willing to commit to. And there are, I believe, currently 168 parties out of roughly 200 states in existence. So that is a very significant participation globally. UNCLOSE is also generally considered today to be customary international law. So even states that aren't parties to the treaty will consider it as articulating the key international law rules. And yet, our understanding of Earth's ocean environment in those years when the treaty was negotiated was far more limited than it is today. It was only in 1977 that Robert Ballard discovered the deep ocean hydrothermal vents and their unsuspected ecosystems that rely on chemical energy from the vents rather than sub sunlight. Further exploration has discovered that 90% of Earth's biodiversity may reside in the ocean. And in recent years, the conservation and financial value of that biodiversity's genetic code has been recognized. Mapping of the sea surface, just mapping, just knowing what's there of the sea surface and the sea floor began in the 1990s. And it won't be completed until 2030 if an ambitious project is completed by then. The first ever census of marine life was in 2010, and we are still far from knowing the full extent of ocean biodiversity. And meanwhile, the world population of humans doubled since the beginning of the Law of the Sea negotiations. And our activities have caused climate change, pollution, damage from extraction of fish, and potentially of minerals. Ocean observation offers new discoveries and opportunities for ocean governance, yet marine scientific research is still falling short of the information that we need for truly sustainable management of fisheries and of other extractive or intervening activities like geoengineering or deep seabed mining. Circumstances are far different from the days when environmental managers believed that the resources of the ocean cannot be exhausted and that the solution to pollution is dilution. So a central question of this roundtable, which I am shortly turning to our roundtable participants to respond to, is, is the convention a living instrument that should be interpreted in light of new knowledge new technologies and other new circumstances 
or should the package deal from 1982, revised in 1994, be strictly respected? Catherine, as a leading scholar of public international law, do you think the convention is out of date? And if it is, what can be done? Thank you very much, Simi, for that challenging question. Um, it's particularly opposite to address it, given I've just finished teaching my Law of the Sea classes here at Oxford. But sadly, this dandy exam question is too uh, late to get onto the paper this year. Um, but in answering the question posed, I wanted to just step back a bit and actually test briefly the hypothesis that there is a tension between viewing UNCLOS as a living instrument and strictly respecting the package deal, because I'm not sure I necessarily view these as in conflict if you argue that the package deal itself was predicated upon the intention of the parties, that they were concluding a constitution for the oceans that was intended to have enduring value and flexibility. And in achieving the package deal and the horse trading between provisions, sometimes leaving things open-ended may well have been an integral part of achieving the necessary political compromise uh, reflected in the legal text. So I just throw that out, that numerous terms in the convention are perhaps deliberately indeterminate, um, or they may indeed recognize what you've acknowledged in your preliminary remarks, which is that if we're talking about protection of the marine environment, we need to acknowledge that this is going to be a moving target in terms of our knowledge of the marine environment and our technology to exploit it and human impacts. So protection of the marine environment in Article 192 is a, a phrase that's not defined in the convention and is, to my way of thinking, a classic evolutive term that will be given dynamic flexible force over time according to what our knowledge of the environment is. Another example of that flexibility in the convention text is the reference to generally accepted international rules and standards, GERs, um, which are used as a benchmark um, in many aspects of the convention, which indicates, amongst other things, its reliance on external instruments embodying these rules and standards to do some of the heavy lifting in terms of more concrete regulation so it's not hermetically sealed. So my response to the question, to answer it directly, um, is the convention out of date? is kind of yes and kind of no. Uh, let me explain the yes and then the no very briefly. Um, yes, we could argue in some respects it's out of date because if we look at the UNCLOS regime as a whole, we'd say, well, we've had to have subsequent negotiations. First of a fish stocks, well, implementation agreement in 1994, then a fish stocks agreement to amplify article 63 and 64, on straddling and highly migratory stocks and our current uh, BBNJ negotiations. Um, so that suggests that there are contemporary problems that have been addressed, if uh, only lightly in the convention, that cannot be stretched through treaty interpretation that need new law in order to address those new problems. Um, now, I think the second point, however, that I would make, and this is where the, the no comes in, is that the convention is not out of date because, precisely because of the point I alluded to at the outset, which is the flexibility, the remarkable flexibility that the text has demonstrated through its judicial interpretation to incorporate new environmental principles, for example, and to um, expand to uh, future-proof new environmental problems that arise. So a preeminent example is the one I just gave of generally accepted international rules and standards, which reflects the framework and dynamic character of the convention and the way it can evolve to scientific, technical, and economic developments. Other terms in the uh, convention are by their definition, dynamic or evolutive. And I mentioned protection of the marine environment, which in the South China Sea 
arbitration was confirmed to apply to all maritime zones. And then in Southern Bluefin Tuna, encompassing protection of living resources and in the Chagos arbitration to extend to more than merely pollution control. And finally, of course, we have references by ITLOS to the precautionary principle in interpreting part 12 of the convention, demonstrating its willingness to embrace new, that is post 1982 environmental principles, ultimately I would argue grounded in the convention or package deal text. So it's out of date only insofar as new problems have arisen that can't be read into the text and are addressed externally and relatedly to it, but it continues to govern all of the major maritime zones and issues that you alluded to at the outset, Sumi, but uh, there are areas, of course, uh, for future development, which we'll doubtless touch in later contributions. Thank you. Uh, negotiating treaties is costly for states and stability in interpreting them is valuable. Del Christian, how do you see evolving interpretations of UNCLOS from your perspective as a public official? Thank you, Simi, for that, um, that question. And um, thanks also for uh, inviting me to this uh, distinguished panel of um, leading experts in this field. Uh, as a government official, I might come at this from a slightly different angle than the professors. Uh, that remains to be seen, but it, uh, from my experience, sometimes um, government officials do come at these issues from a slightly different angle. Um, of course, you gave the introduction pointing to the this instrument. It's um, uh, massive support. Uh, it's comprehensiveness. Um, and I think that is the strength of this, uh, this instrument, and that has proved to be the strength of this instrument over the years. Um, and I was um, attended the SPLOS, the, the States Parties meeting, um, when we had, uh, or we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the entering into force of the uh, convention. Um, Parties repeatedly, uh, they pointed to the, um, the balance of uh, rights and duties. They pointed to the pre predictability. Uh, they pointed to the stability and the pre they pointed to the, the effect the convention has uh, in uh, preventing conflict. Um, that, th these elements, I think, uh, speaks in favor of uh, a cautious approach to uh, maybe not um, reading uh, or being too expansive in the reading of the of the convention, but this does definitely not. Uh, this is not an argument for not uh, making sure that the convention uh, serves its purpose, and um, the uh, provisions uh, do or the regime in in total um, this framework that Dan Claus is it. In my mind and in my experience from the ministry, it does um, allow for finding solutions to practical pr problems as they arise. Um, we have seldom come across uh, a situation where we have felt totally lost uh, in the convention. Um, and I would also like to point at the um, flexibility in the regime which we have seen uh, in uh, establishing the, the, um, the implementing agreements, uh, notably the, uh, the fish stocks agreement and the, uh, and the um, uh, agreement on um, ISA, and now also the BBNJ agreement, which show the, the will of the, the parties to uh, take this regime forward. Uh, of course, when we uh, agreed at the UN to enter into the negotiations on the BBNJ, of course, it was a massive support for the idea of this agreement being under UNCLOS, being an implementing agreement in UNCLOS, implementing the obligations that are already there. Again, showing how important it is for the parties to preserve this balance. Of course, there is a conservative um, effect to this as well. But I hope and think that it's possible to combine this and uh, and uh, 
still uh, see and use the uh, the um, uh, element or the elements of the convention as uh, a problem solver also in the in the times to come. Um, I should also mention just very briefly um, a flexibility that was shown, uh, for instance, on the, the deadline of providing information for the outer limit of the continental shelf, um, where the SPLAS actually made a decision uh, making it possible for states to make a preliminary uh, submission of information to avoid states from missing the deadline and uh, suffer or po potentially suffering the, uh, the consequences of not reaching the deadline. Um, last point, uh, I would also like to point to this framework uh, or this regime that NCLOS establishes. I'm sorry about that. Um, I should have put that on mute. Um, this, within this framework, we also see states working together, developing different uh, instruments to kind of um, fill in uh, where needed. Uh, I, I participated a few years ago uh, in establishing a new agreement for uh, fisheries in the Arctic Ocean, which is placed firmly within the, uh, the framework of UNCLOS, but which is a new agreement uh, establishing, for instance, the, uh, the precautionary approach and uh, not allowing fisheries until we know enough uh, or we're sure that we know that fishing will not harm the, the stocks. So that shows also that it's not only within UNCLOS, but it's in, within the, the larger framework of, of um, uh, the convention that we can, um, can expand and develop this, uh, this instrument. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dire, what are your thoughts on this? Um, so, um, first of all, I should also just say thank you very much for inviting me. Um, those of you who know me know I like to begin by saying I disagree. I think I disagree makes everything much more exciting. But, but actually, in this instance, I want to agree with both Catherine and Kel Christian, um, even though they, they seem to be coming at this from different directions. Um, so Catherine's approach seems to be suggesting, uh, well, there are possibilities for, 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 for interpreting the convention in a way that it addresses all of these issues that we have. Whereas Kel Christian is suggesting a little bit more caution and that ultimately we shouldn't make the convention or we shouldn't read the convention in a way um, that creates obligations that aren't there. Um, I think both of those viewpoints are right. And I think what, what makes it possible for this particular convention to be a living instrument, even though it was in, uh, um, adopted in 1982 and there are so many new problems, um, is precisely because there are opportunities and forums for, um, for uh, lawmaking processes and uh, processes that help the convention evolve, so to speak. It's not the case, it shouldn't be the case, and I think this is then Christian, um, Kel Christian's point, that we identify a new problem and we simply read it in. There are rules of interpretation, um, and Catherine alluded to these. So, 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 so in the convention evolving, we, we have to remember that it is an instrument of states and that ultimately it is through, through, through the conduct of states that the convention can evolve. This happens in a number of forums, right? So if you think about the fact that um, um, around the Law of the Sea Convention, you have, for example, forums like um, the informal consultative process where states speak, states identify problems, um, and a consciousness about a new new ways of dealing with these problems develops. And I think this this then also alludes, or, or this also contributes to um, to um, uh, facilitating an evolutive uh, an evolutive interpretation of the convention in a way that still respects the fact that this is an instrument that is created by states. Um, you still have so you have um, various forums under the Law of the Sea Convention for um, judicial settlement of disputes that also contributes to the interpretation of the instrument. It also contributes to the evolution. But again, here the caution of Kel Christian that it's not that the fact that a, uh, a court or a tribunal has made a particular determination means that that is an appropriate interpretation. The function of the court, the function of the courts is to settle the disputes, but in terms of lawmaking, ultimately what 
what's really important is the extent to which that interpretation is accepted in general by states parties, right? So you have all of these things that, that, that within this particular instrument allow for um, a, a, a really evolutive um, interpretation responding to um, new crises um, and new developments. Thank you for that both insightful and diplomatic response. <laughs> Patricia, with your experience as legal advisor um, of the permanent representation of Portugal to the European Union, needing to work with many states in implementation of the convention and with the divided competence between the EU and the states as well, how do you see this question? Well, I join my colleagues also in thanking you for the invitation to be present today and uh, and I start with uh, um, a bit in the same way as Diri, but uh, uh, not to say that I disagree, <laughs> but to say that I do agree with much of what's been said uh, before. I think it's very interesting um, that um, the UNCLOS has been called the constitution of the oceans as a living instrument. And, and I think that brings us also to draw parallels with um, um, the instruments of uh, national constitutions. Uh, they are instruments that are supposed to last for a long time. They're not supposed to be, uh, unless something very wrong happens, they are not supposed to be um, changed um, um, very frequently. Uh, and they have different levels um, in the sense of, you know, some uh, provisions are core provisions and they can only be um, uh, changed by uh, an instrument of, of the same value. So that needs a treaty of modification. But there are, I think, other provisions that can be um, uh, adapted. And in that sense, the living uh, instrument part, they can adapt it to new circumstances through, as it was said, um, the development also of, of customary international law, uh, the development of um, interpretation, treaty interpretation, subsequent practice. Um, and also, in a way, um, even though that cannot lead to the change um, in the in the in end clause, uh, but complemented in a way also through soft law, so through political declarations. And I think it's very important what Diri was saying, in the sense that we have here um, a number of forums where states come together to discuss issues uh, related to the convention, like the meeting of the state par parties, the ICP. Uh, but also the annual negotiation of the Euro, uh, Oceans Resolution in, in, the, in the GA. So that, that also brings in this uh, more institutional framework for keeping uh, the convention as, as a, a living instrument. Um, although I think I agree uh, with a point that was made by uh, Catherine that in, in, in regard to certain issues um, in order to be able to legislate, we might need to, to change the convention. And that's another question. That's another discussion also because of the difficulties that we have um, legally, but also politically and especially thinking about the, the current context of changing or having any new <laughs> instrument. In fact, I think if we were to negotiate such an instrument as UNCLOS today, that would be probably be impossible because the political consensus would not be there. But I wanted to refer to something that you mentioned related to my experience um, also as legal advisor of Portugal um, in the permanent representation to the European Union. It's the fact also that uh, I think UNCLOS in a way was also very modern and very visionary in the sense that uh, um, the EU well, at the time the European communities was um, um, allowed to be a party uh, to, um, to UNCLOS. It's uh, one of the first um, big mixed agreements, significant mixed agreements where you not only have member states but also you have an international organization uh, and in this case, of course, because of the question of the um, shared competences between the member states and the EU and the part that is of exclusive competence of the European Union, and namely the question of uh, fisheries, uh, fishery conservation and management. And so uh, during the negotiations, it was very interesting that once we 
started speaking about the EZ, then it that became clear that the EU needed to be also become a party. And I think that's a very interesting development also in the sense that uh, um, that has made UNCLOS also an, a living instrument in the sense that it has the, 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 the adapted to the increased relevance that international organizations have um, in the international relations arena. And, and in fact, uh, it's very interesting also to see how uh, the European Union not, also, also not only is an active part in negotiations in these different forums, uh, there's been a heavy deal, um, a deal of uh, um, negotiations among the member states and the EU, sometimes not so evident to the third countries. I know the processes, I've seen some of the, those negotiations and uh, um, it's very hard uh, sometimes for the rest of the world to be waiting for the EU position. It's something that adds some, some um, complexity to the, to the negotiations. But, but I think it's also very interesting how, in fact, also with regard to dispute settlement, and if we think at the, you know, at the landscape related to dispute settlement in international organizations, uh, the European international organizations don't have access to the ICJ uh, as, as in contentious proceedings. But in this case, uh, in, the, in part 15, it is possible uh, uh, for uh, the um, European Union to be a party of contentious proceedings, including arbitrations. There have been at least two arbitrations involving the EU um, and also uh, to be also an active part in advisory opinion. So I think that's also something that brings uh, this uh, modern modernity and, and adaptation to uh, new, new circumstances, the fact that we have um, a very uh, lively um, um, integration also of these new realities like uh, the role of international organizations um, also in the area of oceans and the law of the sea. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. So Nilifer, you were uh, involved in the advisory opinion. Actually, you led the legal team for IUCN in the IUU uh, advisory opinion that the Law of the Sea Tribunal delivered. Should the deal struck in the convention be respected or if evolution is needed, how can it be achieved? And of course you may um, join other speakers in thinking that this is not a contradiction. <laughs> Thank you so much, Simi. <clears throat> and I also want to join my very dear colleagues and friends and, and thank you, thanking you, W. Sal, Christina, uh, for organizing this event. And it's really for me a great privilege to be with my very distinguished colleagues today. Um, and you were one of the uh, key members of that team, uh, the uh, W. Sal IUCN team that appeared um, before it lost on the IEU advisory opinion case. Um, indeed, uh, I, I would agree that I don't necessarily see a tension um, between the so-called, the, the package deal and the idea that the Law of the Sea Convention is a living instrument. I think the notion otherwise would be placing the Law of the Sea Convention somewhat in a straight jacket. Uh, and what I understand from the package deal um, there are certain core issues, and for example, one area that I'm interested in concerns navigation and straits, for example. Uh, a core issue there had to do with uh, the expansion of the territorial sea in, in return for transit passage. So that would be changing that transit passage would be, would, it, would be a clear violation of the package deal. But then we have this other area of interpretation. Um, and as you so well uh, enumerated in your opening, um, the many different issues that have emerged since the Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated and adopted in 1982. But I will say that it is a remarkable convention. And I fully agree with Patricia. I don't think we could have such a convention today. And I would be very hesitant to even say that it's outdated because I think when you look at part 12 on protection and preservation of the uh, marine environment, I think the, the instruments that came after the Law of the Sea Convention for protection of the environment are not quite as strong uh, as the Law of the Sea Convention is. And so I think that it really offers us a great deal of foundation uh, within the 320 articles, there's so much in that convention, um, but it can't cover everything. And it is true, things have, have emerged. 
and uh, we see, and it has responded, for example, with the um, uh, uh, highly migratory and straddling fish stock agreement, now with the BBNJ agreement. Um, so there is this margin of uh, adaptability, and I think that's where I, uh, what Shell Christian is saying, that's where the states come in. But then there's a role, role for courts, and, and Deary mentioned that. And I think that's where we come in from the advisory uh, opinion, which was very interesting. I won't go into the debate about, uh, I know there was a question about whether uh, it lost had a jurisdiction for a general advisory opinion. We know the CBIT chambers uh, can do for um, uh, part 11, but this was an advisory opinion on uh, four questions having to do with IEU fishing. Um, so putting that aside, it's important though, because at the time the Law of the Sea Convention was adopted, we didn't have IUU fishing. That wasn't the terminology. We had distant fishing, but that terminology, IEU fishing, came in um, in the 90s. Um, and it, the issue became um, uh, also, it's related to the exclusive economic zone. So it was an opportunity for interpretation uh, to understand what the rights and obligations of flag states were in the exclusive economic zone of another state. Um, and it was an advisory opinion, and it was very important because one, I won't go into the details, but it was able to incorporate new developments such as IE fishing, and also to give a very interesting um, interpretation to Article 94 on the rights and obligation of flag states, which in the convention doesn't mention fishing, <laughs> but the tribunal did it. Now, I don't know, perhaps some might argue that the tribunal went beyond uh, the scope of the convention, but if we want, we're talking about a living convention, evolutive interpretation, it's important. And we see that's the role, I think, with part 15 um, in bringing in compulsory, and that's one of the package deals as well, compulsory settlement of disputes is actually allowing for that to happen, but this was an advisory opinion. So anyway, I think, um, I definitely think that it's a living instrument, and, um, and it will continue to be a very relevant instrument for many years to come. So thank you, Simi. Thank you, Nilifar. Um, as this is the core question, um, I am, uh, invite Deary to give his response or further comment. Um, it's not a response. It's actually just an addition that last point also just, um, made me think maybe this is a point that ought to be emphasized um, that that the fact that it's a it's an advisory opinion at least for me from a from the contribution of 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 lawmaking and I use the the term lawmaking in a broad sense to include interpretation um, it has exactly the same effect as um, uh, a contentious jurisdiction case the only difference is that a contentious jurisdiction case is binding as between the parties to the contention. But in terms of its lawmaking capabilities, they both fall under Article 38.1D of the statute of the ICJ, right, a, a subsidiary means. So I think it's 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 still very powerful. And um, so I wouldn't put in that little, but it's only, it's still really important, I think, um, the fact that you have these advisory opinions, which 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 very often give us this possibility for an expansive interpretation. Thank you for that further uh, thought. And that is so tempting to follow up on, but I'm going to keep us on the, the subject of our rich menu of topics. Um, and we will further pursue that another day. So let's turn to a question that's in the headlines and before the International Law Commission. Climate change is affecting sea level in many small nations and, um, one of the great achievements of UNCLOSE was the system of ocean zones and baselines. They're crucial to the system of rights and obligations under UNCLOSE. Nilifer and Patricia, you co-chair the ILC Working Group on Sea Level Rise. Nilifer, could you share the key points of your paper for the ILC and give us some insight into how the Commission's approaching this? Well, thank you, Simi, and, and the timing for this question is perfect. Uh, we have just started um, this week our very first meeting uh, 
of the open-ended study group uh, on, on uh, sea level rise in the commission. Today um, was the, tomorrow's the last day of it. Um, so we're very, I think we're all, you know, very excited about this issue. It's such an important issue. Um, and of course it directly implicates the law of the sea convention. And one thing I like to remind people is that one of the first topics on the agenda of the commission when it was first established was the law of the sea. Uh, and, and from that came the 1958 Geneva Conventions. So it took a long time, 70 years almost, but we're back to the law of the sea again. Um, so it, it, it is um, the, in terms of the law of the sea, and, and I, there are three topics that the commission is addressing, the law of the sea aspects, uh, protection of persons, and that's Patricia's, and then loss of statehood, which is um, another colleague of ours, Juan Jose Santillario. Uh, so right now we're focusing on the uh, law of the sea issues, and that is with my co-chair, uh, Bogdan Oresco, we uh, authored the first issues paper. Um, so the key issues, of course, and this is where, whether there's a gap or different interpretations, but what happens to the baseline um, if the base points and the baseline uh, are inundated because of sea level rise, does that baseline have to be changed? In which case that has a, implications for maritime zones and the very important maritime entitlements, very important, particularly easy. So just to give you an example, if the baseline disappears and you have to move it now landward or coastal erosion, that means that part, what was once EEZ, part of it could become high seas. Um, and those are very different regimes. Um, so these are the issues that we're looking at. Um, and of course, um, also the questions of islands. Um, what happens if an island that is fully entitled uh, to all the maritime zones becomes uninhabitable, unable to, uh, to support an economic life of its own under 100, Article 121 of the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, does it turn into a rock, in which case, or does it devolve into a rock, in which case the, under the convention, the maritime zones would be limited to territorial sea, would basically lose the exclusive economic continental shelf. These are real issues uh, because we know small island developing states are actually being inundated. They're actually losing uh, territory. They're actually seeing their potable water being uh, inundated with salt water. This is a question of habitation. Um, so here the Law of the Sea Convention doesn't really directly answer these questions. And so there are lacuna. And the question is how can international law, how can states, how can we respond to this? And so uh, the commission is taking this up. Of course, the International Law Association has already also looked at these issues, but the difference is the commission has a direct relationship with states through the sixth committee. Um, so we'll see, we just started, um, but state practice is important. And I know we have Shell Christian here, but we, it's very important to get states engaged in this process as well. So I'll stop here because I could go on for a long time and I won't. <laughs> Thank you. We'll have to read your reports, which uh, as they appear on the International Law Commission website. Um, and Patricia, could you speak to your share of the topic, please? Sure, and I promise to be very short. Uh, as Nilfer said, I think we both could go on and on this topic for a long time since we're we're working in it. Um, um, of course, I mean, sea level direct impact on all the sea issues on the question of baselines and maritime zones. Uh, but I think that um, we felt that it was important not to look at it only uh, from the law of perspective, because uh, uh, sea level rise has the impact to affect classical elements of the state, both the territory in terms of the maritime territory, uh, 
uh, but also uh, the population and 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 the, the the status of the of the state. So uh, we are also looking, but that will come only next year so this year we're dealing with a lot of these issues uh, looking at the impact in terms of the possible loss of statehood and what type of legal solutions uh, could be found to address um, the possible loss of statehoods and, and and there's a certain connection of course I mean this uh, subjects are all interlinked uh, if if uh, the state disappears also what happens to the maritime entitlements, uh, but only to view and uh, uh, displacement of those persons. I'm not going to go longer. I think my internet connection is also a bit unstable. So I'm sorry if you can hear me very well. I, it held up just just enough for us to hear. Um, so this, this clearly is an issue that we should be keeping our eyes on. Um, and we're so glad that the International Law Commission has taken it up. You can find um, the International Law Association's work on their website, uh, but the, I think you're coming at it from some different angles too, so that'll be interesting. So climate change has also uh, given us a number of different issues in addition to sea level rise to address through legal measures in relation to the ocean. And one of them is climate change interventions which um, I'm wondering if that isn't just a euphemism for geoengineering and making it hard for people to do keyword searches. Um, it could include solar radiation modification. It could include ocean-based carbon sequestration, um, maybe other measures. Catherine, I'd like to turn to you because of the important work that you've done in particular on the Oxford principles and subsequently, um, and how do you see UNCLOSE providing possible rules, principles, institutions, procedures to support governance of research and deployment of these technologies in the marine environment? Or if UNCLOSE doesn't provide it, where should we look? Thanks, Amy. This is one of those, I would have thought, almost Jules Verne type subjects manipulating the climate, all these wacky technologies. But in fact, um, we have already experienced some instances of field trials taking place, including in the ocean domain. And I think what makes it so topical for today's discussion is that marine geoengineering first came on the radar in consequence of an incident early in this century where a project took place off the coast of British Columbia in Canada that was variously described as a salmon enhancement program where ocean iron filings were placed into the ocean as a way of stimulating biological productivity. But this is also one of the proposed marine geoengineering techniques. If you stimulate algal bloom, you have more CO2 attracted and the theory goes that that's absorbed, then the um, algal bloom sinks and you have uh, carbon sequestration through this natural process that's uh, stimulated by human intervention. Um, and what was controversial about this project was the uncertainty about the legal regime that would apply and the particular difficulty in legal characterization. Was this a field trial of a new and emerging technology or was it the commercial use of additional feedstocks for raising a commercial fish stock salmon and its enhancement? Now, if we look at the Law of the Sea Convention, I think it provides only a very basic framework in this respect. And I think it's telling that the most concrete action that's been taken on marine geoengineering has not been under the Law of the Sea Convention, but in fact was taken by the parties to the London Convention and Protocol, who initially issued a letter of concern in respect of the incident I just referred to, 
and then proceeded through their framework, which is much more flexible than that of UNCLOS, um, where amendments and annexes are more easily adopted, um, to provide for a legal framework uh, to govern geoengineering research in the marine, um, marine geoengineering research context. Um, so following that um, letter of concern, you had the amplification of a regime for approval of marine geoengineering activities, which are listed in a new annex under the LCLP, which I'll refer to it as. Um, and so the approach of the convention is to prohibit activities uh, placing material into the marine domain unless they're explicitly permitted by annex under the convention. So the London Protocol dates from 1996 and very much reflects modern environmental principles in this regard. So a new annex four on marine geoengineering is left open-ended. Ocean fertilization is the only thing on the list now, but it's future proof so other things could be added to the list. But in order for any ocean fertilization to take place, what happens under the LCOP is that you need an assessment framework to assess what the environmental impact will be, to have a monitoring program in place, and of course, ultimately, to assess whether this is legitimate scientific research. What is legitimate scientific research? Well, the um, assessment framework for that, again, is set out by the parties to the LCLP. And in addition, since this is rather futuristic, uh, there is provision for international experts to guide the contracting parties and states faced with a permitting situation to be able to assess whether this is legitimate scientific research and uh, what its impact on the environment might be. None of this is at deployment. This is purely at the uh, legitimate scientific research level. Well, if we contrast that with part 13 of LOSC, marine scientific research isn't defined. There's an old debate about whether Article 246 covers both applied and pure research and how we divide a line between them, can we, and so on. Um, so I think this particular issue, Simi, is one that really illustrates the point I made earlier about how the convention can't do everything. And for the heavy lifting where you need a detailed regulatory structure that can be easily amended and adapted over time as new geoengineering techniques um, emerge um, and where we need regulatory control um, insofar as it's the introduction material into the maritime domain, a global instrument already exists to address it. So I don't personally see the Law of the Sea Convention performing a primary role here, but clearly a backup role in terms of, again, providing our basic jurisdictional framework. Um, I'm not going to address deployment. I think I've said enough, but certainly research is covered, um, but uh, by an instrument outside of the Law of the Sea Convention framework. Thank you. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, and, and maybe has some lessons for the BB&J negotiation too on assessment and scientific research. Um, because this is such a novel question, I am going to take a moment to invite if any of the other uh, members of the roundtable would like to comment or question. All right. Um, then I'd like to turn to another topic, which has been very much a focus of global attention in the last year, which is equity. And maybe it's not something that we talk about as much as we should in the marine context. But Deary, you have written quite a lot about different aspects of equity. What principles of equity do you think are relevant in the context of the ocean? And does UNCLOS do justice to? So does UNCLOS do justice to them? I mean, that's the really difficult part. Um, let me maybe begin by sort of mapping out what I think are the well, I think I should start off by saying that I think much of UNCLOS, actually, I don't like that word UNCLOS, much of the Law of the Sea Convention is really an attempt at finding some, some kind of equity. Now, whether or not it's successful or not is a different question. 
But I think you can look at most parts of uh, the Law of the Sea Convention and see an attempt at sort of like um, establishing some kind of um, um, an equitable balance. Um, the more obvious provisions that we can think of, um, uh, for example, the capacity building uh, and technology transfer provisions um, in part, what is it, part 14 of the convention. So clearly that's an attempt. And again, whether it's successful, that's a different story, but clearly that's an attempt at some kind of a, um, uh, an equity achieving um, uh, framework. Um, the other more common example, the one that I've spoken about more often um, um, is part 11 of the convention, right? So the, um, uh, um, so, um, the common heritage of mankind principle. So that's also an attempt at equity. Again, whether the convention is successful or not at that um, is a different story. You have other provisions that are not as well known, but that, that are equally clearly and obviously directed at equity. So um, the convention provides for the rights of landlocked states to um, have access and transit through coastal states in order to have access to the ocean, right? That's based purely on equity. Um, again, if you look at the text of the convention, um, of the convention, you can ask yourself the extent to which um, the drafters were successful because of all the ifs and buts that are contained therein. Um, the convention also provides for um, the rights of landlocked states to to have a share in the surplus of uh, fishing from the exclusive economic zone of coastal states. That's also clearly intended to be. Um, uh, an equity achieving framework and equity achieving uh, regime. Again, whether or not that's that's successful um, is a different story. Um, but there are other provisions as well that aren't obviously directed at equity, but that are also about equity. So, I mean, um, a number of the panelists have earlier spoken about uh, the maritime zones. I mean, the maritime zones themselves are an attempt at sort of mediating between different interests um, um, in order to achieve some kind of equity. So, so coastal states obviously wanted a much larger um, exclusive economic, uh, sorry, a much larger territorial uh, sea. Uh, Landlocked states were thinking, well, th this would be taking away the high seas from us and so on. The compromises, the exclusive economic zone. So, so, so the convention through all of these compromises is really an attempt at, um, um, uh, at achieving some level of equity. Now, uh, that's that's one form of equity, right? So if you think about equity, we th normally think, well, you know, you've got um, the um, the intergenerational equity, the um, and the intergenerational equity. That's certainly these provisions that I've outlined um, that, that I've referred to strike me as more intergenerational equity provisions. Uh, the convention also attempts attempts again to achieve um, some level of intergenerational equity, right? I think the marine scientific. Um, research provisions, um, uh, the provisions of the convention relating to the protection uh, and preservation of the marine environment. These are all forward looking uh, pr pr provisions aimed at attaining um, uh, or at least at achieving um, intergenerational equity. Now, the, the last part of your question, um, has the convention been effective at all of this? Again, like most instruments that are negotiated, well, uh, there are li limits to the extent to, to the um, the extent to which the convention has been successful, and that's why these processes that we spoke of in the earlier parts of your questions are so important, because in a sense they allow us to breathe more into these equity provisions to make them more effective and to make them more successful in achieving equity. That's really interesting. Nilifer, um, what are your thoughts on this? Well, it's, 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 I have to say it's really hard to, difficult to add to what Deere has said so eloquently about equity and the convention. But I'll just add a few thoughts. First, of course, I agree with everything he said. Um, <laughs> I would also add um, that the convention did, I mean, equity was definitely within its goal. And we know that from the preamble. Um, we know that in the preamble, it starts off with basically looking to um, create a just, um, a legal order um, that is just. Uh, anyway, I don't have it verbatim in my memory. Um, and part of this, of course, 
uh, as a reference to equity as well. I think the difference is, is I, between the Law of the Sea Convention's approach to equity is that it's taken it, and, and Deary has uh, enumerated specific areas um, and, and placed it into specific instances where equity applies. And you mentioned maritime zones, but for example, delimitation of maritime delimitation of maritime zones um, is based on achieving an equitable result, or equitable solution. Uh, so we see it in, in various areas, access to surplus fish stocks in the EEZ, landlocked states, so there. But when we look at, for example, the UNFCCC, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, you have broader, the idea of a broader equitable principles. And maybe that's one difference that I would highlight. Uh, that it isn't adopted as a principle per se itself that's that's applied um, uh, to the entire convention. Um, and it is important because I'm going to bring up sea level rise, if you don't mind. <laughs> but it's definitely comes up. Um, where is the role of equity when we're now talking about sea level rise, going back to uh, the issue of entitlements, maritime zones, but even the whole issue of historical responsibility. That's a very important equitable issue. Those states who have the least responsibility will suffer the most actually from climate change, anthropogenic climate change and sea level rise. Um, so, but I think that um, I, it is definitely part of the convention. It's part of the whole spirit of the convention. Um, and I think that we have to keep that in mind. And that's a very important point that you raised, Simi. So I'm, I'm, I welcome that question very much. Thank you. Thank you. And to continue the, the theme of equity and the specific question of the common heritage of humankind. So in the convention, it was narrowed from what Arvid Pardo had originally proposed to just dealing with uh, the minerals of the deep seabed in the areas beyond national jurisdiction. Now we're thinking about this question again in the context of a, the negotiation of a new treaty for conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And we're thinking about it particularly in relation to access and benefit sharing of marine genetic resources. So Dere, in your view, can the common heritage principle, ha has it been narrowed in international law by having been specifically defined in the convention or can it be read more broadly? And if it can, then how would that help us deal with marine genetic resources? So um, <laughs> I'm going to get some people excited now. Um, I don't know that the convention um, has narrowed uh, the common heritage of mankind principle. I think even in the convention, the principle itself is reflected in broad terms. Um, and in fact, even the, uh, I mean, the, 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 so this whole, um, the convention only um, applies common heritage to um, mineral resources is, is for me based on a misinterpretation of the convention. Uh, the convention says, I, I, I can't remember what the, that provision is. I think it's article 136, 133. So one of those two provisions, either 136 or 100, no, it's 136, says um, um, the area and its resources. It doesn't say the resources of the area are the common heritage of mankind. It says the area and its resources are the common heritage of mankind. So the principle itself the principle itself applies to the area as a whole. The particular regime in part 11, right? So the particular regime in part 11 clearly only applies to mineral resources, but the principle itself applies. So uh, part of what, what started the whole BBNJ uh, agreement negotiation, obviously the BBNJ um, has a much longer history and it was started by other considerations, but part of what, what really led the push for talking about an agreement was to say, well, so there's an issue here. This is one of those issues that the convention has perhaps not, not, not adequately addressed because it establishes this principle and it says this principle is applicable to the area and its resources, but then it only creates a regime for the resources. So 
part of the discussion is to say, well, let's also create a regime then for um, for uh, marine generic resources. Of course, the difficulty with negotiations, and that's probably why you had Article 136 um, and 133, which defines re resources for the purpose of the area. Um, I mean, that in negotiations, you don't necessarily get an equitable outcome. So there are negotiations now to sort of try to, to, uh, to again, breathe life into uh, Article 136, but the outcome is not going to necessarily be an equitable one. The outcome is going to be a negotiated one, which may or may not be equitable. Um, and it is my hope that the negotiators, uh, some of whom are on this panel, um, will um, um, help us arrive at, a, at, a, at, a, at an equitable um, outcome for marine genetic resources. That was a speech, actually. That was a, 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 a political <laughs> rally. I didn't know I had it in me, but there you go. <laughs> well, it was good. We would not know you'd been discussing with the International Law Commission all day. <laughs> but it's good to see you're awake. <laughs> and you've woken us up. Well, um, tell Christian, would you... Uh, the same question for you, please. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you to Deere for that speech. and. Uh, uh, I'm not surprised. I knew you had it in you, definitely. Um, we tend to read uh, those provisions of the conventions uh, more restrictively than, uh, than Dira just pointed out. And uh, we are coming from a place where we see that principle uh, in the convention as being um, reserved to minerals, <laughs> as, um, as was indicated before. Um, and in the BBNJ uh, negotiations, we have, of course, had these discussions back and forth a number of times. Um, but we, as Norway, we have been trying to uh, trying to not reach an impasse on the understanding of the convention on this part, because we think the issue of MGRs and the issue of sharing benefits from uh, MGR uh, utilization or um, it's too important for us to lose it in uh, a battle over how to read the convention. We are very much in favor of benefits from uh, utilization of genetic resources being shared. Um, and we want to contribute to building that regime or making sure that those benefits can be shared uh, without having to say yes or no to the question of how the convention needs to be read on that on that specific point. And I think that is possible. And I do see also, I think, in the, in the negotiations that um, participants, states, I hear nobody is arguing against um, uh, sharing benefits. So we will discuss back and forth uh, what are benefits, what benefits will be shared, to what extent, and so forth. But I'm pretty encouraged by the, the general attitude and the general recognition of the need to establish that system. And of course, this is also very closely linked to the issue that we have been focusing a lot on, is uh, our desire to have every state uh, be put in a position where you can utilize your, your rights and your possibilities under the convention. And this is very linked to that, um, to uh, bringing um, states uh, that are in need of that in a position where they can actually benefit from uh, from uh, the convention and uh, and the regime we have established but uh, so again I, I i would hope we would not get stuck in uh, in a disagreement or a dispute over how the convention should be read on that point and as i said i don't think that is uh, is happening thank you that that is very helpful um patricia would you like to comment on this? And I, I don't know, I know you've had some interesting thoughts on the concept of erga omnes. I don't know if you would see that as applying in this context. Yes, no, I wanted to um, link that, uh, you know, what role uh, obligations erga omnes can play also in connection with what Deary said about uh, uh, the preservation and protection of marine environment being also part of uh, uh, the intergeneration uh, um, equity um, in the sense that I think indeed um, uh, in obligations are a useful tool in the sense of uh, 
promoting um, the preservation and the protection of the marine environment. Um, and in that sense, also um, helping states uh, with the legal tools um, to further that, um, that obligation in the sense that at least I think um, I'm not going to go for the further um, uh, or for the, for the more expensive notion of obligations ergo omnis, but at least if we think of ergo omnis partes in the sense that uh, uh, these are obligations that are owed uh, by the parties uh, to unclose to the other parties to unclose. Um, I, and, and I think in that sense, it, it, uh, it has a role to play in helping uh, to further that, 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 that quest for equity in the sense that uh, the preservation and um, protection of marine environment is an obligation owed to all states uh, by the, that are parties to the convention and all other states that are also parties to the convention have an interest um, in the fulfillment of that obligation. And I think it laws has already um, uh, said on its advisory opinion in the area of 2011 that at least the high seas and the area, um, uh, uh, the, the marine environment in, that, uh, in those uh, um, maritime zones um, are um, um, uh, the obligations related to the, the protection of the marine environment are obligations are ominous. But I think that, that that reason should also be extensive to other areas, certainly the exclusive economic uh, zone. And what's important also is that we have also more and more um, examples also from the point of view of case law of activities that affect the marine environment. I mean, the South China Sea with regard to uh, fishing and to the building of artificial islands, are, I think important examples, but certainly there are others. But the last point I would make, which I think it's particularly significant in the sense that it, it's not something that completely unexpected, but now it becomes a bit more clear, is with the, um, uh, the, the, the order of the International Court of Justice um, on, on provisional measures in the case of uh, the genocide case uh, brought by Gambia uh, versus Myanmar. Uh, the fact that um, uh, the ICJ uh, considered that Gambia had the standing uh, because uh, the uh, obligation to prevent um, genocide was an obligation ergo omnis uh, parties and that was not uh, the standing was not due just to the specially affected states. I think that opens up a new possibility uh, for all state parties to unclose, uh, to uh, bring cases um, before the ICJ or it laws on the basis uh, of the uh, obligation to protect and uh, preserve the marine environment. So I think that's an important development um, also to take into account and that will certainly further um, uh, the, the, the quest for equity and the quest for protection and preservation also having in view the future generations. Thank you. Great, thank you. That's, um, we have a, a question from the audience that reflects one of the topics that we wanted to address. Um, so Alexandra S asked, what do you think about the um, prospects of SIDS initiative for a globally global legally binding treaty to combat plastic marine pollution. And just note that that's been a very stubborn problem that's largely land-based in or origin, but affects the ocean globally. And perhaps particularly disturbing, some fossil fuel companies have indicated that they want to increase their sales of plastic products as they start seeing fuel, fossil fuels decline. Um, Catherine, could you comment for us on what you think is the most effective pressure point for regulating plastic pollution? And do we need a new treaty for that? Um, thanks, Sammy, and thanks for the, the question from the audience as well. Um, if we've all been watching the fire and the sinking of the Express Pearl off the coast of Sri Lanka over the last few um, days will have seen that in addition to the toxic chemicals aboard, they had lots of plastic pellets, microplastics for use in cosmetics and the like. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, this is an example of the introduction of microplastics directly from a maritime casualty. But as Simi has rightly pointed out, um, a, a lot of the problem comes from land-based sources. 
And as we know, these are the weakest provisions in the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, and we have some regional um, seas conventions which have addressed land-based sources. But it's the area where we've been least effective. And it's for the obvious reason that it affects so many human activities on land and so many diverse sources of these pollutants. And the same thing is true of plastics. So we can address certain sources of marine plastics pollutions, the so-called ghost gear problem from the fishing industry and so on. But I think part of the problem and the most effective pressure point is regulating plastics production and use, the whole life cycle of plastics. And so that means we need to look at everything from production to trade, to transport, to retail, to consumer and end of life use. And one of my other hats at Oxford is on a future plastics program, also with the Oxford Martin School, in tandem with uh, some chemists and economists and looking at um, the circular economy and how from the chemistry point of view, we can refashion the polymers that go into the plastics that we still need to use in a way that takes more fully into account their environmental impact, including on the marine environment and their capacity to be recycled um, or reused. So I think it's that plastics life cycle that we need to tackle Bearing in mind also, as you've pointed out to me, that petroleum is one of the inputs to this and that China and the US are major plastics producers as well as major carbon emitters. Um, so all of this is to say that we do have existing instruments in the law of the sea and beyond that can tackle this, a new plastics amendment to the Basel Convention, the Stockholm Convention on persistent organic pollutants. Um, we have our regional seas arrangements, which can increasingly look at land-based sources but none of that actually looks at the plastics life cycle. So I think I was initially a skeptic about a plastics treaty, but I now wonder whether there isn't a role to be played, both in terms of enhancing cooperation, um, but making some of the linkages between this fragmented framework um, and to address this plastics life cycle. Now, not all states are convinced. So we could approach this as states did on a regional basis with LERTAP, the Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution Treaty, where you started with a fairly broad framework, agreeing this is a potential problem we need to address. And our first stage is environmental monitoring and reporting. Um, I think that needs to be an essential part of a, taking assessment state of the environment and the, the leakage pressure points, if you will, particularly for the marine environment. Um, but secondly, I think that some basic principles in a treaty framework, such as prevention and precaution, would be quite important to prevent um, plastics pollution. So again, um, coming back to my point about um, addressing the problem at source. Coordination is also going to be huge. You're not dealing with a blank slate here in terms of treaties, in terms of the different parts of the plastics life cycle. Um, so I think that there will clearly be a problem of alignment. And this may sound familiar from the BBNJ negotiations as well. It isn't a blank slate tiptoeing around that. Um, technical and financial support and in engaging in uh, scientific research, if we can't, we need to rely on plastics. Some form of durable plastics are with us, at least for the foreseeable future. We need to encourage alternatives. We need to encourage scientific research into these alternatives and into the impacts on the environment, marine and otherwise. And again, uh, that's where a facilitative framework could come into play. But even as I say this, I feel like saying we need a reality check. Um, is there an appetite for new law building? If assessments of the existing instruments have already said that they're ineffective, they're too weak, there's non-compliance, I'm not entirely convinced that including and concluding a new agreement on top of everything else we have, rather than doing a plastics audit of existing agreements, is necessarily the right way forward. But it may have a role to play. And I'd be interested in what the views of the other panelists are on this issue. Do we need another treaty? Do we need uh, to fill the gap in this way or improve what we've got? And indeed, um, as we are nearly at the end of our time here, 
uh, our formal time. We can continue um, for another half hour or so to the extent people care to, but I'd like to take this moment first to wholeheartedly thank all the participants um, for making time for this and sharing your thoughts. Um, I'll be going back to the recording to think more deeply about what you've been saying. And I'd like to offer you the opportunity for a last word. Um, and uh, I'd like to offer that first to Deary, who I think has to leave shortly. Um, so I should, first of all, really say that this was a great panel. It was fascinating. I enjoyed um, the exchange that we had and now the lights are going, oh my goodness. Um, I enjoy, and I don't know how to switch them on. Uh, I enjoyed the, the exchange that we had. Um, it was really fascinating. There was a question um, that just came in from the audience. Uh, can the rules in the Law of the Sea Convention be considered use Kogans? And I thought I couldn't resist. I, I just had to respond to that one uh, and very quickly say probably not. What we ought to be doing is thinking about how we can turn them into use Kogans norms, but they probably can't be. Um, so thank you very much for having me. Um, it was a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> um, Patricia, would you like to make a comment either on a plastics treaty on any of the questions or anything else? Thank you. That was really time for Dury to go because they've shut the lights off in the room where we're actually meeting in the commission. No, and I have to say also it's a pleasure, even though we did have not only an exhausting day, but an exhausting six weeks, because tomorrow will be the last day of our six week meeting. It was a pleasure to participate in this round table. And I've certainly learned a lot. Now, I just wanted to quickly reply um, to one of the questions in the chat, uh, or two questions that is also related to sea level rise. There was a question about if has or any state already disappeared uh, and we're not there yet, uh, we're not there yet, but the, the scientific projections do point to um, uh, an increase in the level of the sea, the mean sea level. And that could mean, it, it, it depends. I mean, it depends on the measures that are taking also under the Paris Agreement um, on mitigation and adaptation. Um, it's not, I don't want people to think that this is uh, as dramatic as you know, many states will disappear, but I think the ones that are really at risk are some small island in the Pacific and, and in the Indic, uh, Indian and Ocean, about five or six states that are really at risk of fully disappearing. Uh, but what will happen is that, uh, you know, many islands will become inhabitable. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a slow onset process, um, but it, it was really important that uh, um, within the framework of the law of the sea, but also the other areas that we mentioned that we have um, uh, the, uh, an adequate legal framework to deal with this really new problem. Um, to which certainly the drafters of one clause weren't thinking, but also when we think about other so areas of international that they weren't thinking also. So that uh, international law can be uh, not just reactive, but also pre proactive at least <laughs> for, for once in, in anticipating and preventing uh, the worsening of the effects. Uh, so thank you very much again for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, Chal Kruchstin, uh, final thoughts? Um, thank you, Sami, and thanks again for inviting me. It's been very stimulating to participate in this discussion and uh, uh, particularly interesting to uh, have um, uh, professors uh, showing light on the issues from their angle and particularly uh, those who are actually, in a sense, creating law in the International Law Commission, which uh, is an important body in itself. So we really appreciate the work you're doing. Um, and uh, also let me say particularly that we do appreciate that the, the issue of sea level rise is being dealt with uh, in the International Law Commission. We think that is very important on our way to finding solutions to all the issues that the uh, phenomenon is, is rising. Uh, so the work you're doing there is, is very important, uh, Nilofer. Um, I would like to comment on the uh, very interesting intervention from Catherine on the, on the plastics issue. Um, you said that not everyone is in agreement that we need a new agreement. Uh, 
um, Norway is very much in favor of uh, starting negotiations on a new uh, agreement to deal with plastic. We do not see this particularly as a law of the sea issue because as you mentioned, this is very much a land-based uh, issue, but of course the consequences as you rightly pointed out uh, manifest themselves in the oceans. Uh, but we have also been weighing, is there an appetite? Is there a need? Can we work on the existing instruments? We've landed on the conclusion that we think a new instrument is the right thing, and we will push hard for that, um, particularly on the next uh, UNEA uh, meeting, uh, where we hope to have a decision to actually start negotiations on that subject. Um, and I, um, we, I very much also share your approach, the idea of the comprehensive approach, that it should look at the totality of, uh, of the issue. Uh, in addition to the points uh, Catherine raised, I would just like to point out that we think that to deal with this problem, we need elements in the uh, treaty dealing with development of um, uh, knowledge and also the exchange of knowledge because we feel in our work that we, we see in um, the, the, the knowledge is simply not there. Uh, with all the actors, and that is something that instru this instrument could contribute to, and also creating a, um, a basis or a, an arena for cooperation between uh, the uh, different uh, instruments that you mentioned, uh, which is already dealing with parts of this. Uh, but the main message, I think, is we need the agreement and we need a comprehensive uh, approach dealing with uh, microplastics, um, waste management, uh, recycling. Uh, and so forth. So thanks again for a very stimulating uh, uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Nilifer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Simi and, and Christina. And I have to say, it has been really a really rich discussion, a great round table uh, with excellent questions. And I've enjoyed listening to, to colleagues um, reflect and respond. So finally, um, I will say something about the plastics issue. I don't know if they're closing us down here as well. So I'm <laughs> hearing some noises in the background, apologies. Um, I actually was involved in a project that did a detailed uh, assessment of the legal framework at the global and regional levels and whether there was a need for uh, a new global treaty. And while we do have instruments, but the only global instrument right now is the Law of the Sea Convention that directly addresses um, land-based sources of pollution in a binding manner. Um, there are big gaps in the regional, uh, um, in, in the regions, the Mediterranean uh, is probably the best one, but the other ones are quite weak. So when you look at the landscape, the landscape of the existing legal instruments are inadequate. But I think it does come down to what Catherine says, is there an appetite um, for a new treaty? On the other hand, um, I think that the treaty is a way to focus um, and we can look at treaties that have been successful um, in terms of setting goals and targets. And I think that this is something that when we're talking about the circular economy, we have to start looking at that as well. So taking a systematic approach. But I also wanna say that maybe we also can learn from what's going on with the climate change. And even though the Law of the Sea Convention, um, I think Catherine thought, well, it's weak, but it does put some clear obligations uh, for states to, to, to take adopt measures, legislation to prevent, control and reduce land-based sources of pollution. And I'm thinking this is an area that Christina is an expert in climate litigation. And maybe we should start thinking about the domestic level. And do we have a possible a legal uh, foundation within the law of the Sea Convention to start challenging states on this? So I just leave that as a thought that occurred to me during this session. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much, and uh, and I look forward to seeing everyone soon, hopefully physically. So thank you. Thank you, Nilifar. Catherine, uh, you have the last word. Uh, thanks very much. I mean, no pressure. Then I, I'll just talk for twenty minutes or so. Just just joking. Um, the the 
comments on plastics and climate change just spark a further reflection, which is that it's become unfashionable to talk about the land dominating the sea, at least in certain contexts. But when we talk about climate change and we talk about plastics, that's undoubtedly the case. Um, and I think that as these illustrate, um, I think a two-pronged approach is important to look at what tools we already have, including a vibrant living instrument, the Law of the Sea Convention, and Nilif has rightly indicated um, the uh, fact that it is the only global instrument to address land-based sources, but also to do a, a kind of plastics audit, as indeed happened with climate change. The number of instruments we have that on the face of it have nothing to do with climate change have had to address um, either willingly or unwillingly, the impacts of climate change because of pressures from the parties, from NGOs, through litigation strategies in terms of the impact. And I think the thing, the same is going to be true of plastics. Um, so I just end with that reflection. We have a living instrument and we have problems that transcend marine space, but are clearly intimately uh, linked with and uh, impact upon it that do require a global response hand in glove with our central consideration today, um, the Law of the Sea Convention. I think I'm starting to become worried that the lights will go out on our um, other two colleagues in Geneva. So I think I will bring it to a close at this point. There's some very interesting questions, um, which we appreciate. And I wish that we could go on for uh, maybe a full day conference. But um, instead, I'm going to once again, thank everyone. I'd like to ask Peter if he would have any final comment that he'd like to make. Thanks, Simi. I had two, two things that occurred to me, absolutely fascinating. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, the intersection between the UNFCCC and UNCLOS, uh, there is a lot of work going on in the um, Climate Change Convention on oceans now, and that ocean climate nexus is, uh, there's a lot of science and thinking going on there at least. So I'm just wondering where that might go with, with UNCLOS. And the second thought was <clears throat> on geoengineering. I think the pressure is going to come on to accelerate the drawdown of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that is inevitably going to need some addressing of um, geoengineering or the nutrient enhancement, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think that's very far away. So I'd, I'd leave, leave you with those two thoughts. Um, and uh, nice to see a number of you who I know only on emails, actually at least on video. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, may, maybe we'll all see each other in Marseille. We can keep our fingers crossed for the World Conservation Congress, the great quadrennial meeting of IUCN. Um, so finally, I turn it back to Christina Voigt. Thank you so much, uh, Simi. B before I thank everyone, I just wanted to pick up on something that Peter just uh, mentioned in terms of climate change. Uh, oceans will be looked upon as a nature-based solution amongst others to the issue of climate change. And I just wanted to mention that the IUCN has provided a global standard on nature-based solution in terms of its social and environmental safeguards that are very necessary. So in order to avoid, avoid any perverse incentives that might be infringing on biodiversity and, and nature, by adopting nature-based solutions. So that's a very important work uh, that has been done by the IOCN. I just wanted to bring it to the attention of the audience. And with that, I just want to thank our wonderful, wonderful panel, Patricia, Nilofer, Catherine, Che, Christian, Dida, who disappeared <laughs> into the dark, and um, Peter as well, for this excellent discussion. I, I listened with great, great interest, and I have the impression from the questions that we got that the audience did the same. It was a really engaging discussion, deep into different legal analysis, and I hope that we can find a way to address some of the questions that were posted in the Q&A, uh, maybe directly to, to those who, who asked them, because they have really relevant questions. And I would like to thank you, Simi, 
for masterfully uh, managing and, and moderating this session. It's been wonderful and it was a journey through all different aspects that are contemporary issues and always focusing on the question, is ISL, UNCLOS as a living instrument fit for purpose to address all these new uh, and, and challenging issues? And with that, thank you again. Thank you to the audience again, and thank you to Emily and uh, Claire as well in the background for helping and supporting us uh, today. And with that, I just wish you all to stay safe and see you hopefully soon. Thank you. <laughs>